From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! People were saying they feel so shocked by, by, by Trump. I would just suggest that maybe the, the real thing we're feeling is horror, uh, because shock suggests that this is some bolt out of the blue. Uh, but actually, Trump is the culmination of so many dangerous trends. So if we want to deal with Trump, uh, we need to identify those trends. We needed to get at the root of them, not just say no to Trump, because all that will do was will get us to where we were before Trump, and that was what produced Trump. As President Trump is sued by the attorneys general of Maryland and Washington, D.C., for, quote, unprecedented constitutional violations, and as another federal appeals court rejects Trump's Muslim ban, we spend the hour with best-selling writer, author, activist Naomi Klein. Her new book, No Is Not Enough, Resisting Trump's Shock Politics and Winning the World We Need. Just saying no to Trump is not enough. We need a yes. We need a plan for a way forward. Today, Naomi Klein for the hour. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The U.S.-led coalition is now reportedly killing more civilians in Syria than ISIS, Russia, or even the government of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. That's according to the journalistic monitoring group Air Wars, which based its findings on data from the Syrian Network for Human Rights. The data says U.S.-led coalition forces reportedly killed at least 273 civilians last month, which is slightly more than the number of civilians reportedly killed by ISIS. Overall, the data says nearly 1,000 civilians were killed in Syria last month alone. President Trump's Muslim travel ban has been dealt another legal blow. On Monday, the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit unanimously ruled President Trump had overstepped his legal authority in signing an executive order seeking to ban from entering the United States all refugees and citizens of six majority Muslim nations. The court wrote, quote, the order does not offer a sufficient justification to suspend the entry of more than 180 million people on the basis of nationality. National security is not a talismanic incantation that, once invoked, can support any and all exercise of executive power, the court wrote. In its opinion, the court also cited Trump's tweets, as well as a White House statement confirming that all of Trump's tweets are considered to be official statements by the president. Attorney General Jeff Sessions is slated to testify today before the Senate Intelligence Committee, where he's expected to face questioning about his role in the firing of former FBI Director James Comey, as well as about Sessions' multiple meetings with Russian officials while he was serving as a member of Trump's campaign. Sessions has acknowledged meeting with Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak twice last year. There are also unsubstantiated rumors based on U.S. intelligence reports that Sessions may have also met with the Russian ambassador in April at the Mayflower Hotel hotel in Washington, D.C., during a Trump campaign event. This comes as a close associate of President Trump says Trump may be considering firing special prosecutor Robert Mueller. This is Christopher Ruddy, head of the right-wing Newsmax Media, speaking to PBS NewsHour's Judy Woodruff Monday. Is President Trump prepared to let the special counsel pursue his investigation? Well, I think he's considering um, perhaps terminating uh, the special counsel. I think he's, he's weighing that option. I think it's pretty clear by what one of his lawyers said on television recently. In response, White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer did not deny the claims, but said only that Ruddy had not spoken to the president about this, though Ruddy had been at the White House. In the midst of these controversies, Trump pulled together his full cabinet on Monday. Never has there been a president, with few exceptions, in the case of FDR, he had a major depression to handle, who's passed more legislation, who's done more things than what we've done. We've been about as active as you can possibly be and at a just about record setting pace. In fact, President Trump has not signed a single piece of major legislation since taking office. His executive orders restricting immigration have been blocked by multiple courts. Last week, former FBI director James Comey called him a liar on national television. And during his first 100 days in office, Trump has spent twice as many days playing golf as Presidents Obama, George W. Bush and Bill Clinton all did during the same period combined. 
During Monday's meeting, each one of Trump's cabinet members took turns heaping praise on Trump and expressing their loyalty to him in what appeared to be a publicity stunt. This is Health and Human Services Secretary Tom Price. Mr. President, uh, what an incredible honor it is to, to uh, lead the Department of Health and Human Services at this pivotal time under your leadership. Uh, I can't thank you enough for the, the privilege that you've given me and the leadership that you've shown. Vice President Mike Pence said serving President Trump has been the greatest privilege of his life. President Trump is expected to announce Friday plans to roll back some of the U.S.'s new diplomatic and commercial relations with Cuba, which were brokered under the Obama administration. Trump's expected to make the announcement in Miami on Friday. Bloomberg News reports the changes may include curbing travel between the U.S. and Cuba. Other changes may include reinstating restrictions on Americans visiting Cuba and bringing back famous Cuba goods like cigars and rum. Officials also say Trump might demand the extradition of people who've received political assistance asylum in Cuba, like Asada Shakur. Before becoming president, Donald Trump's businesses violated the U.S. embargo on Cuba, secretly doing business in Cuba in the late 90s and then trying to cover it up. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders attacked the Democratic Party, calling it an absolute failure and blaming it for the election of President Trump. Sanders was speaking at the People's Summit in Chicago before about 4,000 people. Trump didn't win the election. The Democratic Party lost the election. Let us be very, very clear. The current model, the current model and the current strategy of the Democratic Party is an absolute failure. Montana Congressman-elect Greg Gianforte has been sentenced to 40 hours of community service and 20 hours of anger management after he was accused of body-slamming Guardian reporter Ben Jacobs to the ground and breaking Jacobs' glasses the night before Montana's special election. Gianforte won the election. More than 70 percent of Montana voters had cast their ballots during early voting before he attacked the reporter. This is Gianforte pleading guilty Monday to misdemeanor assault. I take full responsibility for my actions. Uh, I didn't act in a way that was consistent with my behavior in the past. And, uh, um, you know, I'm, that's why I was, uh, uh, I was pleased to be here and, and get this done so we can move forward. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I look forward to putting this behind me. I've apologized to Mr. Ben Jacobs. Uh, he has accepted my apology. I'm grateful for that. And uh, now I look forward to going to work in Washington. Gianforte attacked Ben Jacobs after Jacobs asked him a question about the Republicans' health care proposal. In Russia, thousands of protesters flooded the streets in more than 100 cities across Russia in the latest mass demonstration against government corruption. More than 1,000 protesters were arrested. The protests were organized by anti-corruption activist Alexei Navalny. This is one of the protesters Monday. Let's continue in the agricultural state of Madhya Pradesh, India, where farmers are demanding debt forgiveness after a crash in crop prices has left farmers unable to repay the exorbitant loans. The Indian government has launched a violent crackdown against the protests, deploying more than a thousand police and paramilitary troops to the region. On Thursday, the Indian police opened fire on protesters, killing five people and setting off a new wave of demonstrations. Last year in India, as many as 1,600 farmers committed suicide in Madhya Pradesh as a result of unpayable debts. In California, a group of asylum seekers on hunger strike in the for-profit Adelanto Detention Center say they were violently attacked by GEO Group guards Monday morning as they waited in the breakfast area for immigration officials to respond to their strike demands. This is one of the hunger strikers, Isaac Lopez Castillo. When they saw that they could not remove us, they sprayed us with more pepper spray, and once they were able to pull us out, they threw some of us against the wall. In my case, at least, they threw me up against the glass of the phone booth. They pushed my face up into it, on the corner, and Timoteo was drenched, including his private parts, with pepper spray. Our skin is all covered in rashes, and some have gashes from their fingernails, and one of the guys had his dental crown knocked out. They knocked it out because they threw him face-first against the wall. 
And here in New York City, Delta Airlines and Bank of America have pulled their sponsorship of the public theater's summer performance of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, because the play depicts the assassination of a Trump-like Caesar, complete with blonde hair and a gold bathtub. The 2012 public theater staging of Julius Caesar depicted Caesar as an Obama-like figure. This is public theater artistic director Oscar Eustis speaking about the lessons of Julius Caesar before the play on Monday night. This play, on the contrary, warns about what happens when you try to preserve democracy by non-democratic means. And again, spoiler alert, it doesn't end up too good. Julius Caesar is commonly understood as a play that advocates against assassination, depicting the widespread upheaval and violence that results from Caesar's murder. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. The attorneys general of Maryland and Washington, D.C., have filed an anti-corruption lawsuit against President Trump, accusing him of, quote, unprecedented constitutional violations. The lawsuit alleges Trump has flagrantly violated the emoluments clause of the Constitution by accepting payments from foreign governments since he became president. The lawsuit cites reports that the embassies of Kuwait and Saudi Arabia and other countries have booked expensive rooms and held events at the Trump International Hotel on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., possibly seeking to win favor with the president. D.C. Attorney General Carl Racine announced the lawsuit on Monday. President Trump's businesses and his dealings violate the Constitution's anti-corruption provisions, known as the emoluments clauses. My office window is just a few floors above where we're sitting today, and I can tell you that as I look out the window and see the tower of the Trump International Hotel, we know exactly what's going on every single day. We know that foreign governments are spending money there in order to curry favor with the President of the United States. Just one example. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, whose government has important business and policy before the President of the United States, has already spent hundreds of thousands of dollars at the Trump International Hotel. Resistance. Resist resistance against Trump's profiteering while in the Oval Office has taken other shapes as well. Last month, artists projected the words pay Trump bribes here, on the front of Trump International Hotel. Meanwhile, in another setback to the Trump agenda, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit unanimously ruled Monday that President Trump had overstepped his legal authority in signing an executive order seeking to ban all refugees and citizens from six majority Muslim nations from entering the United States. Well, today we spend the rest of the hour with someone who's been closely following the various forms of resistance against the Trump presidency. The best-selling author, journalist, activist Naomi Klein, author of The Shock Doctrine and also This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. She's out today with a new book. It's called No Is Not Enough, Resisting Trump's Shock Politics and Winning the World We Need. In the book, Klein writes, quote, this is one attempt to uncover how we got to this surreal political moment. It's also an attempt to predict how, under cover of shocks and crises, it could get a lot worse. And it's a plan for how, if we keep our heads, we might just be able to flip the script and arrive at a radically better future. Naomi Klein, welcome to Democracy Now! Thank you, Amy. I'm very pleased to be with you in Hi, Juan. Hi. It's great to have you with us. Um, you're beginning your tour across the United States. The book is called No Is Not Enough. What do you mean? Well, um, you know, as you know, Amy, I have been covering crises and major shocks to countries uh, for a long time. And, and, and to be honest with you, when I wrote The Shock Doctrine, and it came out 10 years ago, 
I actually kind of thought no was enough in the sense that I thought that if we understood this particular tactic, and what I, what, what I mean by the shock doctrine is the ways in which uh, large-scale shocks to societies, large-scale crises, economic crises, wars, coups, natural disasters have systematically been used by right-wing governments, um, using the disorientation and the panic in society to push through a very radical pro-corporate agenda. You know, and I have been on the show many times talking about examples of this, like Hurricane Katrina um, and how uh, that, that tragedy and the dislocation of the residents of that city was used to privatize the school system, attack public housing, uh, introduce a tax-free free enterprise zone uh, under, under, under George Bush's administration. Um, but after that book came out, it came out in 2007, we had the 2008 financial crisis. And all around the world, people did say no. You know, people I knew that they were being forced to pay for the crisis of the bankers. They took to the streets. They occupied plazas. They stayed there for months. They said no, no more. Um, but, but, but they didn't, in so many cases, have a plan for what to do instead, beyond just, you know, we, we don't want the austerity, we don't want the attacks. Um, there wasn't a credible plan put forward, in many cases, for how, how we could have a different and better economy a, 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 that responded to the underlying reasons why we are seeing these shocks. And so I think in this moment where Trump is this sort of rolling shock, you know, every day there's some shocking news. We just heard a few examples of it in the, in the headlines. Behind the scenes, we're seeing that same agenda advance very quickly. I'm concerned about what's going to happen if they have even larger shocks to exploit, not the shock of just Trump himself and what he's doing and the various investigations, the various gaffes, the various palace dramas, the rest of it. Um, but I, but I think it's it's really crucial that in preparing for that we understand that there has to be a yes what we want instead of the shock doctrine. So that's why I called it no is not enough and put a great big no on the cover because I just want to make sure no one misses that message because it's a hard won insight after many years. Well, one of the interesting things uh, to me in, in reading your book was the. Um, how you connect, for instance, the work you had done uh, long ago on uh, branding uh, and how the Trump administration has become the branding of the president and how he was able to understand the importance of branding way back during when he was doing the Apprentice program. In fact, you, right. you talk about, you analyze the Apprentice and its impact on American consciousness. Right. So I think we need to understand that Trump <coughs> is not playing by the rules of politics. He's playing by the rules of branding. And you know, there have been presidential conflicts of interest before. <clears throat> there have been presidents with, you know, with business interests before. But there has never been a fully commercialized global brand as a sitting U.S. president. <laughs> that is unprecedented. And the reason that's unprecedented is because this is a relatively new business model. It is the, the business model that has been adopted by the Trump organization is, is really not one that existed before the 1990s. It, it, it is what I called in my first book, No Logo, uh, the, the hollow brand model, right? And, and the model it comes out of uh, the fact that in the—so the original history of branding is you'd have a product, you know, maybe it was rice, maybe it was beans, maybe it was shoes. Um, it, you're a, a manufacturer first, but you want people to buy your product, so you brand it. You put a logo on it. Um, you identify it with, you know, some sort of iconic image, like Uncle Ben's or whatever it is, right? You give it a kind of a personality. That stopped working in the 1980s. Customers got savvy to it. Uh, I had a, probably the most um, requoted quote of mine in No Logo is from an advertising executive who said, consumers are like roaches. You spray them and spray them, and they become immune after a while. It's just lovely insight from a marketer, yeah, about how they see customers. So, so marketing started to get more ambitious, and then you started to see these companies that positioned themselves as lifestyle brands, and they said, no, we're not product-based companies. We are, ide we are in the business of selling ideas and identity. Nike was the ultimate example of this. Nike CEO Phil Knight stepped forward and said, we are not a sneaker company. We are not a shoe company. We are about the idea of transcendence through sports, right? Uh, Starbucks wasn't a coffee company. It was about the idea of community in the third place. And, and um, you know, Disney was family and all of this. So that uh, there was these, you know, the corporations would have their seances and come forward and say, we have our grand idea. 
that this changed manufacturing dramatically, because once you decide that you are in the business of selling an idea as opposed to a product, well, it doesn't really matter who makes your product. It, what you want to do is um, you want to own as little sort of hard infrastructure as possible, and your your real value is your name and how you build that up. So Trump was more of a traditional business in the 1980s, and Trump was just sort of like a guy who built buildings, but built buildings and had a flair for marketing. But the game changer for him was The Apprentice, and that's when he got to he realized he could enter the stratosphere of the super brands. And his business model changed. It no longer became about building the building it, uh, or buying the building. That was for other people to do. He was about building up the Trump name and then selling it and leasing it in as many different ways as possible. So you've got the Trump water and Trump steaks and Trump's very so-called un dodgy university. Um, and so many of the towers, the Trump towers around the world, the Trump resorts around the world, those are not owned by the Trump organization. The Trump organization is paid millions of dollars uh, by these developers for the privilege of putting the Trump name on those towers. So this has huge implications for how we understand the corruption at the heart of Trump's decision to merge his global brand with the U.S. government, which is what is underway on so many different fronts. Because honestly, what it means is every time we say the word Trump, <laughs> even when we're saying it in a negative light, we're doing his marketing for him. So, you know, this lawsuit that was just announced by the attorneys generals of New York and, and D.C. Maryland. Yeah, sorry, of, of Maryland and D.C. Um, yeah, maybe New York will get it. <laughs> um, it's, it, you know, it's getting at part of it in the sense that foreign governments are clearly favoring Trump hotels as a way to ingratiate themselves to the president. But the conflict is more continuous than that, um, because, because Trump's big idea the, this, the idea at the center of his brand is the power that comes with wealth. Uh, and so the more powerful he is, and of course he happens somehow to have uh, got himself the most powerful job in the world, um, th th that fact alone is massively increasing the value of his brand, which his sons are uh, cashing in on busily on every front by selling that name for inflated prices. And of course, Trump, by not divesting from the Trump organization, profits from that as president. So the, the conflict is is baked in, happening every second. So you talk about jamming the Trump brand. How? Right. So this this um, phrase, you know, culture jamming, was was uh, very much um, you know, in vogue in the 1990s when these super brands sort of emerged and started kind of projecting their names onto ever more sur surfaces. Uh, you know, maybe you remember some of the campaigns like "Just Don't Do It," which is exposing the the sweatshops that that, that Nike products were being made under. Um, you, you know, uh, uh, Joe Cancer taking on Joe Camel. Uh, the the um, this you know, cartoon character was basically selling cigarettes to kids. Um, so, yeah, I've been thinking about how, how, how do we jam the Trump brand, because I think you have to kind of accept Trump on his own terms to some degree, and this, and, and this idea that we're some, going to somehow catch him out, um, damage him by proving that he is corrupt, um, you know, that he treats people awfully. That's his brand. His brand is that he's the boss and he gets to do whatever he wants. That's what he has been selling now for many, many decades. So well, the more well, he gets away that, with uh, it, to yeah. To get back to the apprentice, the 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 apprentice, as you uh, so aptly described, was really based on a. A selling a cutthroat brand of capitalism to the American people as the way that people should be. Yeah. Uh, and it's televised class for. I mean, it opens up with an image of a homeless man sleeping rough on the streets of New York and then cuts to Trump in his limousine. And it's basically like, who do you want to be, the homeless guy or Trump, right? And so, you know, this happens, uh, you, you know, the show launches, um, you know, at, at a time when people understand that this—that that neoliberalism is not lifting all boats. It is this cutthroat world of winners and losers, and which one do you want to be? And, and that was very sharply played out in The Apprentice, and it got more brutal as the show went on. And, I, you know, I didn't know this until I started researching this book. I have to admit, I'd maybe watched The Apprentice a couple of times. I didn't know that in later seasons, they uh, they deported half of their contestants into tents in the backyard. And they called it Trump's trailer park. Um, and, the, you know, they would, they would, they would, they would 
overlay the sound of like howling dogs at night, and it was just, it, it was this idea of. Uh, creating drama out of the massive inequalities of our economic system, um, the, the people I I who were sleeping in the backyard, who'd been deported into Trump's trailer park, would peek over the hedges to look at the people living in the mansion, you know, drinking champagne and floating around in the swimming pool, right? So, so I think that this is part of his appeal, like, not to challenge this massive inequality, but to promise that if you play by my rules, you end up in the mansion, um, and it will be even sweeter sweeter because people are sleeping outside, right, because you won. Uh, and, you know, I think that this has been very much the message that he ran on as president, right, the promise of lifting you up, the chosen few, right, the white working class. Um, and at the explicit extent, ex uh, uh, at the explicit expense of, uh, uh, of brutality uh, against people of color. Right, um, and and so that formula that he honed, that was so profitable, that got such great ratings on The Apprentice, you know, is now the world is his reality show. And you know, the, I quote Newt Gingrich in the book, where Newt Gingrich was asked, and he's been such a booster of Trump's, what he thought of Trump staying on as executive producer of Celebrity Apprentice, and Newt, Newt Gingrich, in a rare criticism of Trump, said that he thought it was a bad idea, because Trump was now the executive producer of a show called The United States. And I thought that was, you know, a, a, a rare moment of truth, right? We've all been recruited as extras into well, this show. I think the Trumps have declared this week Apprentice Week, and he and his daughter and advisor Ivanka Trump are going to Wisconsin today, where they're going to Waukesha, where a GE plant is closing and it's heading to Canada, where you're from. And we're going to talk about all this and more with Naomi Klein. Her new book is out. It is called No Is Not Enough, Resisting Trump Shock Politics and Winning the World We Need. We'll also talk about this weekend in Chicago, where we both were. Bernie Sanders held a major event, the People's Summit. 4,000 people came. You'll hear some of what he has to say. And also what happened in Britain with Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour leader. Is he soon to be the British Prime Minister? Stay with us. Even in your darkest hour, you're luckier than anyone you know. Better not catch you complaining, girl, you know. There's a lot of ways this could go. Let's think that this old world needs is more hot air. Yeah, more hot air to blow. Better make a Terrifying Sight by Ani DeFranco here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. This weekend, 4,000 people packed the McCormick Place Convention Center for a People's Summit. Independent Senator, former presidential candidate Bernie Sanders, delivered the keynote speech. During his speech, he repeatedly criticized the Democratic Party, calling it an absolute failure and blaming it for the election of President Trump. I'm often asked by the media and others, how did it come about? that Donald Trump, the most unpopular presidential candidate in the modern history of our country, won the election. And my answer is, <laughs> and my answer is, 
that Trump didn't win the election. The Democratic Party lost the election. Let us, let us be very, very clear. The current model, the current model and the current strategy of the Democratic Party is an absolute failure. This, this is not, this is not my opinion. This is the facts. You know, we focus a lot on the presidential election, but we also have to understand that Democrats have lost the U.S. House, the U.S. Senate. Republicans now control almost two-thirds of the governor's chairs throughout this country. And over the last nine years, Democrats have lost almost 1,000 legislative seats in states all across this country. Today, today, in almost half of the states in America, Democratic Party has almost no political presence at all. Now, if that's not a failure, if that's not a failed model, I don't know what a failed model is. That's Bernie Sanders speaking on Saturday night at the People's Summit in Chicago at the McCormick Place Convention Center. Um, it was an event that was organized by many different groups, um, primarily the nurses uh, united, nurses around the country. About a thousand nurses were there. And uh, Naomi, um, we were both there. Um, can you talk about the significance of what Bernie Sanders said? Now, remember, he is in the Democratic yes. leadership right now of the Senate. He's supposedly like the outreach person. He was brought into it. But he's got a fierce critique of the Democratic Party. Yeah. And I think he's been biting his tongue a little bit. I, I, I might speculate that he was inspired by what just happened in the U.K. with Jeremy Corbyn. He, we know he just came back from a trip to the U.K. Um, because it, 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 there is an interesting parallel in the sense that Jeremy Corbyn um, was elected by a grassroots, insurgent, youth-led movement. At, he was elected as leader, originally, um, a, a youth-led movement uh, called Momentum in the U.K. Many, many young people who joined the Labour Party in order to support Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and the, there was this. They were treated as, you know, invaders. Like instead of being excited of, of this, about this wave of, of interest in the political party, the Labour Party establishment, the, the so-called New Labour Party establishment, because Labour was rebranded by Tony Blair in the late 1990s to be the New Labour Party, which is kind of like a Labour-scented party, uh, as opposed to a party of actual working people, um, really using the tools of marketing, uh, um, as opposed to. Uh, having a party that knows what it stands for and who it stands for. And so, uh, so, so Jeremy Corbyn was elected, and there was just this campaign of sabotage. It was just the end of the world. He's unelectable. He was smeared. Then there was a coup to try to unseat him. He was sabotaged relentlessly by his MPs while he was uh, leader, who were constantly leaking damning information, um, trying to make him look bad in the press, sabotaging him at every front, right? Um, but the insurgency was ultimately successful in that this campaign was a tremendous upset. It was a—sorry, this, this election was a, a, a tremendous upset in the U.K. Uh, uh, Elizabeth May did not need to call the election. She said she wouldn't call the election. The only reason she called the election, because she was so convinced that she was going to get an overwhelming majority, which was supposed to give her this mandate to get the best deal possible under Brexit, uh, as they negotiated with the EU. And there's this huge upset. And, and in fact, she loses all these seats. She loses her majority. Jeremy Corbyn wins about 30 seats. Let's go to Jeremy yeah. Corbyn in his own words. What's happened is people have said they've had quite enough of austerity politics. They've had quite enough of cuts in public expenditure, underfunding our health service, underfunding our schools and our education service, and not giving our young people the chance they deserve in our society. 
That was Jeremy Corbyn speaking. I wanted to ask you, in your, in, a, in a no is not enough, you also raised some criticisms of why Bernie Sanders was not more successful during the primary campaign. And you raised the issue that some people claim that Hillary Clinton rolled identity politics, uh, uh, as well as the machinations of the Democratic Party, to be able to, to persevere against him, uh, and that it was an issue of identity politics versus class politics. But you raised some criticism on, on, on that. I'm wondering if you could expand on that. Yeah, I mean, and I endorse Bernie and 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 support him. I think he's a tremendously important voice, and and I'm so grateful to him. And but I, I don't think we, uh, you know, do do ourselves a, a service on the progressive side of the political spectrum. You know, those of us who do believe it, it is a moment for deep change, uh, as opposed to these little sort of tinkering changes, to not engage in self criticism in this moment. I mean, I am sort of disheartened by the extent to which some of this debate is still frozen, and as if we are. Are still in the primary, and you, you still have people in their heart. You know, Bernie would have won camps, and um, and 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 you still have Hillary supporters refighting and blaming Bernie supporters for Hillary's defeat. And it's just like uh, we have to get out of that debate. And I think on uh, um, uh, among the people who did support Bernie, like the many thousands of people who were at the People's Summit, I think it is it's it's very important to understand. Why Bernie wasn't able to 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 go all the way, right? I mean, he got 13 million votes. He took 22 states. He got closer than any uh, uh, you know he candidate who described himself as a democratic socialist. His campaign is a political revolution. I mean, it was it was incredible. But I don't think Bernie Bernie lost the primary because the democratic base is too conservative for Bernie. I think he lost the primary because he was not able to connect with, to speak to enough black and Latino voters um, who tend to be more progressive than the rest of the Democratic base, um, and also to older women who, who who felt that their issues were were, were too much of an add-on or t sort of tacked on. So, you know, I think, frankly, the, the best quote in my book is from Michelle Alexander, the author of The New Jim Crow, a wonderful author and theorist and activist. And, you know, she said to me that if, um, you know, the progressives cannot do a better job of connecting with black voters, of understanding the role of race um, in American history and telling that story differently, she said they better get Elon Musk on speed dial because they're going to need another planet. Um, and, and so I think we, we — and one of the things that I found really inspiring about the People's Summit was I think that critique was really embedded in the way the, uh, the weekend was organized, I mean, beginning with the voices of of, uh, of organizers of color, the Million Hoodies movement. We heard from uh, the, the chairs of the Women's March, um, you know, including Linda Sarsour on the opening night, speaking explicitly about the need for a deeply intersectional politic, to use Kimberly Crenshaw's, um, you know, a, a very important framing, um, and saying, no, this is, not a, uh, this is not a competition between class and economics and so-called identity politics. It is deeply interconnected. And we can't understand the story of the United States and what this economy is without understanding how race has been used systematically as a wedge to divide um, and enforce this brutal economic system. So I think that critique is making it in there. Uh, you know, I didn't don't make the critique in the book, um, you know, in the spirit of finger pointing, but just because you know, what we are seeing with Bernie's candidacy with Corbyn's candidacy, with with Mélenchon's candidacy in, in France, who came two points shy. Explain yeah. who Mélenchon was, well, not Mel to be confused yeah. with the uh, new prime minister. Right. So, in, in the French elections uh, recently, in, in um, the there was a there there was a surprise where Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who is a, who is a very left-wing candidate, significantly to the left of Bernie Sanders, I think he was calling for a, a rate of a 100 percent taxation for the rich, right? Running on a campaign of you know, really deep redistribution uh, of wealth in order to to pay for the social safety net. A, a, um, it, it was a it was a much less xenophobic message. It was a much more friendly to refugees than we've been hearing. 
from French politicians, uh, you know, even in the, on the so-called left, an anti-war message, a pro-peace message, making the connections, as Jeremy Corbyn did, um, between uh, this, the failed war on terror model, um, foreign interventions and terrorist attacks in France, in Jeremy Corbyn's case, in the UK. I'm really trying to get at these root causes. Jean-Luc Mélenchon picked up, I think, 10 points. I mean, he, he surged at the end, and he came—he you know, was at the end of the, of the campaign, and this is on the first ballot, because the way the French election work is, it, it, is they, they have multiple candidates on the first ballot, and then they narrow it down to two candidates for the, for the final vote. For and, president. Yeah, and all of a sudden, Mélenchon's getting 70,000 people at rallies, right? I mean, his was the campaign that had the energy. Um, and, and he came within two points of Marine Le Pen, so he almost made it onto the second ballot, which would have meant that it was a race between a Hillary-like neoliberal figure, which is who, who Macron is. Macron's a former banker. He imposed economic austerity under the government of François Hollande, despite Hollande having won uh, the election originally, promising uh, to resist uh, uh, the imposition of austerity in France. Um, so it would have been him versus Mélenchon, which would have been a very interesting race. As it turned out, it was Marine Le Pen versus Macron, and, uh, and, 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 and thankfully, you know, France rejected fascism. But my concern is that after, you know, four years of the kind of privatizations, deregulation, um, austerity politics that, that I think Macron is almost certain to impose on France, I'm worried about that setting the stage for a surge uh, for the Front National, which is, you know, people have made these um, direct analogies between Trump and Marine Le Pen and sort of holding up Macron as if, well, this proves that neoliberalism can beat, uh, you know, a candidate like Trump. But Marine Le Pen is not Trump. Marine, the, the, the more accurate equivalent would be David Duke. I mean, this is a party with ties to Nazism historically um, that, uh, that, you know, that, that, that aligned themselves with the Vichy regi regime. Uh, the fact that they got, you know, around 30 percent of the vote in France is absolutely shocking. It's nothing to feel, you know, complacent about. We're going to break and then come back to our discussion. We're going to talk about what Trump just recently did, pulling out of the Paris Accord, um, as well as health care and where it goes in this country. Naomi Klein is from Canada. We'll talk about single payer and what are its chances today, as the Senate supposedly in private is crafting a health care bill. We're talking to Naomi Klein. She has a new book out today. It's called No Is Not Enough, Resisting Trump's Shock Politics and Winning the World We Need. Stay with us. I pity the country. I pity the state. And the mind of a man who thrives on hate. Small are the lives cheats and of liars, of bigoted news press, fascist town crier. Deception annoys me, deception destroys me, the Bill of Rights froze me, jails they all know me. Frustrated our churchmen, the saving of soul men. The tinker, the tailor, the colonial governor, they pull the palm, me. they're seeking to draw me away from the roundness of the light. Pity the Country by Willie Dunn. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, early, earlier this month, President Trump announced he will withdraw from the United, uh, the United States from the landmark Paris Climate Accord that was signed by nearly 200 nations in 2015. Today, the United States will cease all implementation of the non-binding Paris Accord and the draconian financial and economic burdens the agreement imposes on our country. 
In his speech, Trump said he wants to negotiate a better climate deal. So we're getting out. But we will start to negotiate, and we will see if we can make a deal that's fair. And if we can, that's great. And if we can't, that's fine. I'm willing to immediately work with Democratic leaders to either negotiate our way back into Paris under the terms that are fair to the United States and its workers, or to negotiate a new deal that protects our country and its taxpayers. Naomi Klein, a better deal? Uh, I just can't wait, Juan. I mean, it's been took 25 years to get this deal, but I'm just looking forward to another 25 years, right, to, to get an even better year. Because when it comes to climate change, we've got nothing but time, you know? <laughs> Sorry, that was unfair sarcasm for democracy now. But, no, I, I, uh, I mean, everything about what he said is just so extraordinary. Um, and, uh, in particular, this idea that the, that the deal is unfair to the United States, that is this draconian uh, uh, top-down. I mean, the, the deal is, is so weak, right? And, 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 and the reason it is weak is because it doesn't impose anything on anyone. And the people who made sure of that were the U.S. negotiators, uh, who fought tooth and nail. Uh, and this is not under Trump. This is, this is under Obama. Um, but, you know, in large part because they had to bring the deal back to the, the U.S. And if it was a binding treaty, they would have had to get it ratified uh, by a Republican-controlled House. And they knew that they couldn't, right? So the U.S. fought the world, which wanted a legally binding treaty and said, well, then you won't have us involved. So, it was, so what, what the deal actually is, is, is really just a kind of patchwork of the best that every country could bring to the table. The U.S. brought Obama's Clean Power Plan, a, a plan to accelerate uh, the decommissioning of coal-fired power plants, uh, new restrictions on, on, on new coal-fired power plants that would require that, that they sequester more carbon. Um, it was a fraction of what the U.S. needed to do to do its share of the goal of the Paris Accord, which is to keep warming below 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius. Um, you know, when you know, when, when that deal was announced, I joked that the governments of the world came together and said, we know what we need to do, and we're willing to do roughly half that, right? Um, because if you added up what all the governments brought to the table, it didn't lead to a trajectory that would keep warming below what they said they wanted to do, but it would lead to warming of double that. But under Trump, they had already announced that they weren't even going to do that. So this whole debate about Paris was whether or not the U.S. was going to stay in the accord but treat it as if it wasn't worth the paper it was printed on, which would have had, a, you know, a very insidious uh, moral hazard for other governments, because then, if, if you have a volunteer kind of good-faith agreement, and the largest economy in the world is treating it like a joke, which is what would have happened if Trump had stayed, they made that clear as soon as they said that they were rolling back the clean power plan. Then that would have encouraged other governments that were already starting to slip, like the government of Canada under Trudeau, you know, went to Paris, made all kinds of wonderful speeches, and then went home and, you know, approved two new tar sands pipelines um, and ch cheered when President Trump approved the Keystone XL pipeline. So that's three well, new that's, tar sands I, pipelines. I wanted to ask you about that. You know, Just the, uh, the impact on the climate change movement of, in the last few months, all of these reversals of Trump, Keystone, yeah. Dakota Access. So, yeah, what, what's, right. what's your sense now of how the movement uh, it will be able to function, and also the right. importance of the local resistance of cities and states uh, to the federal government? Well, to be honest, I mean, I think that this just the the shock of just seeing Trump, you know, in the Rose Garden, just lifting that middle finger to the world, um, I think that is proving to be more of a catalyst for other countries and for states here in the U.S. and cities here in the U.S. to understand that this is the moment to step up, to increase uh, ambitions. Whereas I think if if, the, if it had been more ambiguous and they had, they had stayed in um, and and sort of pretended like there was something happening and what is Ivanka having a good influence on him or things about to get better? I mean I don't think we would have seen this kind of very bold response of having you know, hundreds of mayors step forward and saying no we're committed to Paris. The mayor of Pittsburgh coming forward and saying um, you know after Trump said I was elected by the people of Pittsburgh not the people of Paris. The mayor of Pittsburgh stepping up and going actually. 
you were not elected in Pittsburgh. Um, Pittsburgh voted for Hillary, and I'm going to get the city of Pittsburgh to 100 percent renewable energy by 2035, which is the, exactly the level of ambition we need across the board if we're going to hit that ambitious temperature target in the, in the Paris Accord, if we're going to keep temperatures below 1.5. So, you know, that I, I think this is and then obviously you have we the... would like this not to be happening. We would like Donald Trump not to be president. We would like not to have such an array of bad options on the table. But given what we have, I would say that 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 it, that that people are stepping up. And that is what the climate movement needs to be doing, is sending this very clear message that because of the recklessness, because the U.S. at the federal level has gone rogue. At every level that Trump does not control, whether it is universities and their fossil fuel uh, holdings, you know, whether it is states and their ability to, uh, to to get to 100 percent renewable very, very quickly, because we don't get our energy at the federal level. We get it at the state level. We get it at the provincial level. We get it at the, at, at the city level. At all those places where Trump doesn't, con doesn't control things, there has to be an increase of ambition. And, and, and thankfully, the climate justice movement is, uh, you know, I think, really focused on that and understands that that's the mission now. And, and I think we're seeing more, am am uh, more ambition, including, you know, universities being likelier to divest their holdings, putting uh, uh, financial pressure on the industry. I want to ask you about health care. You come from mm -hmm. Canada. Um, th this weekend, I mean, it was a major topic of discussion at the People's yeah. Summit, because you had National Nurses United, a thousand nurses at this 4,000-person event. Um, and yet, um, this moment, where you talk about how critical it actually is um, to seize upon what's happening. The, we just have this. Um, uh, on Monday, Senator Sanders tweeted, breaking, Senate Republicans just released the schedule of hearings, committee markups and public testimony for their health care bill. His tweet includes the image of a blank white piece of paper. Um, wouldn't be this be the moment where people across the country, in fact, some polls suggest the majority of people in the United yeah, States, yeah. would put forward something different from Obamacare, mm -hmm. certainly different from what the Republicans yeah, are putting yeah. forward? What would that look like? Right, and and this is starting to happen because I, I you know I, I think this is this is also part of the Sanders effect of seeing how popular it was to, to you know to stand before the country and 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 talk about single payer on the Canadian model right and yet People, he hasn't introduced a new bill at this point for but, single payer but in California um, it, the the Senate just got one step closer the California Senate just got one step closer uh, to to single payer at the state level right and this is you know there is a vacuum that's being created. By the by, by by the Trump administration going rogue on all of these fronts, and it is creating a space for boldness at the subnational, at the municipal level. Um, you know, climate is an example. Healthcare is an example. Imagine if we were to see this proliferate a, across the country, um, and people <laughs> realized and experienced in their lives that um, it is possible to have a far less bureaucratic system, a much simpler system with quality health care that is cheaper. Um, you know, this is what uh, we we have in Canada. And, you know, unfortunately, it has been under ceaseless attack by various politicians that have underfunded it. But it's still, you know, it's still a, it's still a good system, despite what people hear a lot. You know, you hear a lot of, um, you know, attacks on the Canadian system, endless waits. And I don't want to idealize it. But then, you know, look at what just happened with Jeremy Corbyn in the UK to bring him back into the conversation. I mean, some of his most powerful messages were about uh, the NHS and um, and what has the happened, yeah, the, the, the public health care system, which has been systematically starved in order to get it ready for privatization. And he just named that. And he made these very powerful campaign ads, including one, a beautiful one, directed by Ken Loach, um, that, you know, featured nurses and doctors, including a pediatrician who broke down crying about having to send a child to be hospitalized 500 kilometers away from from where his family lived um, and where they couldn't visit him. And, um, and, and, and people stepped forward and were galvanized by a desire to reclaim this system, because when you have universal public health care, um, no politician can run against it. That's why they have to chip away at it bit by bit. And always, every politician, no matter what party, will always
always claim they are defending the public health care system, whether in the U.K. or in Canada, because they will not get, get elected. So what they do is they try to kill it by these little, you know, a thousand cuts, and then they say, well, it's impossible, their waiting lists are, are, are too long. I, I want to ask you, uh, no is not enough, the title of the book. You've talked about that uh, the movement needed to have a vision of the world it wants. Talk about the LEAP Manifesto and what it represents. Right. So, you know, what I, what, what I, what I argue in the book is that the, the greatest uh, victory of the neoliberal project really comes back to what Margaret Thatcher said, um, you know, many decades ago, which is that there is no alternative, that however bad these policies are for your, for your life, the alternative would be even worse. It would be sort of economic apocalypse. Um, and, and I think that when we, when we cast our minds back to the response to the 2008 crisis and the first wave of resistance like Occupy Wall Street and the, and the movements of the squares across Europe, um, that, that the spell of neoliberalism was, 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 was breaking and people had the courage to say, no, we don't want this model but somehow lacked the courage to step forward and say, this is what we want instead. This is the economy that we believe is workable. We have the resources in this time of unprecedented private wealth to provide the basics for everybody, quality health care, quality education, housing for all. Um, you know, we can we, we understand that war is making us less safe. We want to be a society that welcomes refugees and those in need. I mean, a, a transformative vision. And we believe we can do this in a way that gets us to 100 percent renewable energy as quickly as technology allows. And in the process, we can create huge numbers of unionized jobs. Um, people, we, we weren't there yet. We didn't have the confidence yet. And I think this is just the hangover of neoliberalism. But that is really changing. The Leap Manifesto is an example of that in Canada, of um, you know, movements coming together, it was, it was endorsed by 220 organizations, a very broad range of organizations, from small grassroots groups to large NGOs to the largest trade union in, in Canada, um, labor federations coming together to try to sketch out that yes, what is a progressive trade policy, um, and, uh, and and how do we get to make this bold transition off of fossil fuels? in a way that begins to heal some of the wounds that date back to the brutal founding of our country, that puts indigenous rights at the center of it, um, racial justice at the center of it, that connects migration to climate change, to war, to bad trade deals. Um, you know, it is not a perfect document, but I, I included it as an example of what I describe in the book as a sort of um, a reawakening of the utopian imagination. In this country, I would point to uh, the vision for black lives, the, the, the document that, that uh, came out during the election campaign out of the movement for black lives, which is, you know, incredibly bold people's platform. And we are in this moment in the sort of Trump resistance where there's a lot of uncertainty about what the electoral strategy is. You know, I was at the People's Summit. It was fantastic. But I didn't leave it knowing what the plan was in the sense of it wasn't clear who the candidates are going to be the next time around. It wasn't clear if it was a strategy wholly inside the Democratic Party or whether there were people there who were talking about wanting to form a party outside. This is, you know, this is a question that I, I certainly can't settle. I'm not in a position to settle this. But what I do know is that social movements are surging. And I think that we are in a position where we could have really bold people's platforms that emerge from below. And there's lots of examples of this starting to happen as movements come together out of their silos to get clear on what the demands are, what the yes is. And then whoever the politician is, whoever the party is, they have to follow that people's platform. And the media has to um, be there, too. I mean, you had the Globe and Mail calling the leap, uh, what, manifesto, a <laughs> national suicide. Oh, that was national suicide. Oh, that, that may have been the National Post, but the oh. Globe and Mail just called it madness. <laughs> It was good. It's called the Leap Manifesto, uh, caring for the planet and each other. And they were like, that's insane, <laughs> you know? <laughs> It'll kill the country. Yeah. And do you see the media changing as more and more people join the media in different ways yeah, I mean, and the what independent I see, media? Is it, not, is it not hurting us? I mean, the more, I mean, the, uh, one of our national newspapers, the National Post, uh, ran 35 negative articles about the Leap Manifesto and then refused to publish one letter to the editor <laughs> trying to correct the record, you know? But, People kept signing it. 
you know? Um, and and you, I, I guess we have the tools to, you know, it's a 1,400-word document. 30 seconds. We can, people can read it themselves and make up their own mind. And I think there's such a distrust of the traditional punditocracy that, Amy, you have described, the people who know so little about so much. And I think people are finally catching up to you and understanding that. So, ultimately, do you hold out hope? You know, I think this is this moment where, you know, progressive ideas are more popular than they've been in my lifetime. But on the other hand, so are white supremacist ideas. And that is playing out on real bodies in real time on the streets. It is a race against time. Naomi Klein, best-selling author, journalist, columnist for The Intercept, her latest book is out today. It's called No Is Not Enough, Resisting Trump's Shock Politics and Winning the World We Need. That does it for our broadcast. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Our website's democracynow.org.